This lecture is going to take the conservation of energy equation that we just developed and apply it to a whole series of open system components. The governing equations for all components are as follows. First, we have conservation of energy that we just developed in the last lecture, but we also need to remember we also have conservation of mass. So these are the two equations that we're going to apply to a whole series of open system components. So the key thing here is to discuss the simplifying assumptions for each component. When we're applying this energy equation, there are no situations where we're going to need to keep all of those terms in a single analysis. So we need to be able to recognize as we apply this equation to various situations, various types of equipment or components, which of the terms in this equation are most important for those particular components and that's what this discussion is going to be about. So we begin with a turbine, a very common component in the types of systems that we'll be looking at. So first of all our schematic symbol for a turbine that we'll be using is shown here. So we have an inlet and the inlet conditions are shown here with a subscript 1 and here's the exit coming out at condition 2. So state 1 and state 2. At this point it doesn't matter what the substance is that's going through this turbine. So the schematic symbol that we're going to use for a turbine is this trapezoid here that shows an expansion occurring. So as this substance goes through here this is meant to indicate that it's expanding and we show a shaft here to remind ourselves there's a work output from this turbine. So there's a mechanical connection between this device and its surroundings so that a work transfer occurs. So we draw a control volume around that turbine and we begin with our complete conservation of energy equation and what we want to talk about is some common assumptions that we make when we're analyzing a turbine and in particular we want to understand the impact that those assumptions have on the complete open system energy equation and what the resulting simplified energy equation looks like. The first one that we'll talk about is the steady assumption or steady state. Most of the problems that we're going to be looking at in the course will be steady problems. We will be looking at unsteady problems, but for the purposes of identifying the most important energy transfers in a turbine, we're going to assume steady state. So that means that the energy inside of our control volume, so inside this control volume, is not changing with time. So the impact of that on the equation is to get rid of the unsteady term. So that will be set to zero. The next assumption is that potential energy is going to be negligible. So there is usually a small elevation change between the inlet and the exit, but the change in energy associated with that is extremely small. So for turbines we will always be assuming that the potential energy is negligible. So that gets rid of these two terms in the inlet and exit summation signs. The next one is that kinetic energy is also negligible. Now in reality there may be a difference in velocity between the material entering and leaving the turbine because its conditions have certainly changed and the pipe size may also be different. But those kinetic energy changes are negligible compared to the other things that are happening that the turbine is actually designed to achieve. So a turbine is simply not designed to change the kinetic energy of the fluid stream appreciably. So we can get rid of both kinetic energy terms, both at the inlet and at the exit as a result. Our next assumption is that heat transfer is negligible. Now this isn't quite as good an assumption as the previous ones we've made because quite often there can be some heat transfer from a turbine that might be important to take into account in certain situations. However, right now we're trying to get at the main energy transfers and heat transfer is not one of those. Typically turbines would even be insulated to try and minimize the amount of heat transfer with the surroundings. So in terms of the main things that are happening here, we can neglect heat transfer with the surroundings. So this Q dot term will also be set to zero. The next thing that we'll say is that there's going to be a single inlet and that's certainly consistent with our schematic here. We only have one inlet so this summation sign we don't need. There's only one inlet and 
a single outlet. And again, the illustration we have here, there's only a single outlet. Now this particular assumption, while it's true for this situation, is not always true. We will be analyzing turbines later in the course that have multiple outlets, and there's a reason for them to have that, but we'll address that when it happens. So if we look at the impact on the equation of all of these assumptions, we're left with these terms. So zero on the left hand side, because it's steady state, Q is gone. The shaft work is certainly retained and we see that here we have shaft work transferring across our control volume right there. Now notice I've changed the subscript. This is our general equation that we're applying to any control volume. So the subscripts we have on here are just to remind us that this is work and heat transfer across our control surface. But now that we're looking at a particular component, we typically put a subscript on here that is more descriptive of the component that we're looking at. So here I've put a subscript T to indicate we're taking this equation and applying it to a turbine. So that is the shaft work for the turbine. And notice we need to carry this sign down as well. Nothing has happened to that. The next thing we see is that the summation signs are dropped because we have a single inlet and single exit. And because we have a single inlet and a single exit, and because it's steady state, we only need one mass flow rate here. So there's no subscript on the M dot because the mass flow rate at one and the mass flow rate at two have to be the same. So this M dot is right there. Our inlet enthalpy here we put the subscript 1 on it because we've named our inlet 1 and the exit enthalpy here we put the subscript 2 on it because we've labeled the exit 2. Of course in a complex system where we have multiple components a turbine might not be going from 1 to 2, it might be going from 3 to 4 or 5 to 6 or whatever and we would adjust these subscripts appropriately. So this is what's left of our conservation of energy equation when we apply it to a turbine. And so typically we would move this work over to the other side and we see that the power developed by the turbine, remember this is a rate of work transfer, is equal to the mass flow rate through the turbine times the decrease in enthalpy, so H1 minus H2. And the turbine is delivering work to the surroundings, so that is positive. And that makes sense here. H1 will be bigger than H2. There'll be a decrease in enthalpy as the substance goes through this turbine and a resulting positive power produced. So that is our simplified version of the energy equation for a turbine. Now we can take this equation and divide both sides by the mass flow rate. So the right hand side just becomes H1 minus H2 and the left hand side we start with a power we divide it by mass flow rate and we get the work produced per unit mass. So this is on a rate basis and this is on a per unit mass basis. So small w would be kilojoules per kilogram. The work developed for each unit of mass that goes through that device. Now let's just take a look at what this might look like on a PV diagram. So for the purposes of developing this PV diagram, we're going to assume that the substance going through is an ideal gas. Certainly doesn't have to be. We'll be looking at lots of steam turbines in the course, but here we'll say it's an ideal gas. Well, we notice that as the substance goes through this turbine, there's a decrease in enthalpy. And for ideal gases, the enthalpy is tied directly to temperature. So we can show two lines of constant temperature on here. And remember what a line of constant temperature looks like on a PV diagram for an ideal gas. It's just an inverse relationship between P and V that looks like that. So here's the high temperature inlet and there's the low temperature exit. So we're going from this line and dropping down to this line. So a typical turbine process might look like this. So this is why it's called an expansion through a turbine because the specific volume is increasing. We're going from high temperature here through the turbine dropping down to a lower temperature at the exit. Now I want to just alert you to one fact here. Earlier on in the course when we were looking at closed systems we were used to calculating work as the area 
underneath the curve on the PV diagram. So we used work is equal to the integral of P dV to calculate work. Now I want to alert you that that is no longer the case for open systems. So the work produced by this turbine is not the area underneath this graph anymore. That only works for closed systems. Later on in the course, after we've talked about some second law concepts, we will come back to a PV diagram and there is a graphical connection between this work produced and what's going on on the PV diagram, but we're going to leave that for later. At this stage, just don't make the mistake of using work equals integral of PDV for a closed system. Now, the next component that we're going to look at is a compressor. And we're going to see some striking similarities here between a turbine and a compressor. And the reason for that is from an energy balance point of view, applying conservation of energy to this component, these are really exactly the same component. And I'll point that out here as we go along. So first of all, our schematic symbol for a compressor looks very much like a turbine. We have an inlet and we have an exit and we have a shaft connecting the device to the surroundings but in this case the work is being done by the surroundings on the device. So the only difference here is we actually show a converging section instead of a diverging section. So the inlet is at the large end and then the substance going through here is compressed and it leaves at the smaller end. So that's our new schematic symbol. Well our objective here is to look at a simplified version of conservation of energy for a compressor. So we're going to be starting with identifying our control volume again around the device we're looking at. We bring out our complete conservation of energy equation to make sure we don't miss anything that's relevant. We list our assumptions that we're going to make and rather than going through them one by one I have shown exactly the same list as we used for the turbine because the assumptions we would make for a compressor are the same as for a turbine. That will also get us to the main energy transfers that are important in a compressor. So it's steady state, the potential and kinetic energies are negligible, heat transfer with the surroundings is typically quite small, and a single inlet and a single exit. So all of those assumptions are the same and of course we're starting with the same equation so the impact of those assumptions on the equation is also the same and so the simplified form of the equation is also the same. Notice the only difference is I've used subscript C here to indicate that we're talking about a compressor here. So exactly the same assumptions applied to exactly the same equation therefore exactly the same result. Now compressors and turbines of course are different things but the thing that is different about them is that the direction of the energy transfer is different. The work transfer has the opposite sign and now instead of a decrease in enthalpy flowing through it there'll be an increase in enthalpy. We have material coming in here at one value of H work is done on that material and it comes out here at a higher value of H. So the work is negative and the sign of the enthalpy change is opposite. But of course this equation is exactly the same. So we can rearrange it exactly the same way as we did before. So the work rate or the power of the compressor is the mass flow rate times H1 minus H2. That's identical equation to the turbine. Notice of course though H2 is going to be bigger than H1 so this work will be negative and that is consistent with our sign convention. The next component we're going to look at is a nozzle. So for a nozzle there's no shaft connecting it to the surroundings and it is intended to accelerate a fluid stream to increase its kinetic energy and so we show it as a converging section. So a single inlet and a single exit and a converging section. So our control volume again is around the component that we're analyzing. Our energy equation is exactly the same every time for a starting point. The assumptions that we'll make 
first of all steady state operation so we know that that gets rid of the unsteady term on the left hand side the potential energy is certainly negligible there's no elevation change of any significance from one end to the other so we can get rid of those potential energy terms there's no work transfer notice that our control surface doesn't have any shaft sticking out of it so here's a way to look at this if there is no shaft there is no shaft work so the work transfer term can go the shaft work term can go next heat transfer is typically very very small this nozzle might be operating at an elevated temperature typically would be and so there would be a little bit of heat transfer with the surroundings but it may also be quite well insulated so that that heat transfer is negligible so we can get rid of the heat transfer term as well next we see that there is a single inlet and a single outlet the same as in the previous components that we analyzed so when we take that list of assumptions and apply it to our energy equation what remains is a balance between the enthalpy change and the kinetic energy change so those are the only two things that are left in the energy equation so the enthalpy through a nozzle goes down and the kinetic energy goes up and those effects have to offset each other now notice that we have a mass flow rate here still but because we have a single inlet and a single exit and we're operating at steady state those mass flow rates have to be equal so I haven't shown any subscript on them and in fact we can cancel them out and that's what happens in the next equation here so H2 minus H1 is equal to the change in kinetic energy as the material flows through this nozzle now typically the kinetic energy at the inlet can be neglected so the gases or substance coming into the nozzle typically has a very low velocity certainly compared to the exit so it's quite common to just neglect that kinetic energy at the inlet so we finally say that the kinetic energy at the exit and remember this is on a per unit mass basis is equal to the decrease in enthalpy as the material flows through the nozzle now just like we looked at a turbine and a compressor and came to the conclusion that they were essentially the same component from the point of view of conservation of energy we also have a companion component for a nozzle and that is a diffuser so a diffuser has exactly the opposite purpose to a nozzle a nozzle is there to increase the kinetic energy of a fluid stream whereas a diffuser is there to decrease the kinetic energy of a fluid stream so the inlet would typically have a high kinetic energy and we want the exit kinetic energy to be low so the symbol for a diffuser is just the opposite of a nozzle it shows a diverging section which implies that the fluid is slowing down so we identify our control volume we start again with the same equation and we make exactly the same list of assumptions as we did for a nozzle steady state no potential energy change there is no work or heat transfer and a single inlet and a single outlet so the impact on the equation is the same and the resulting simplified equation is the same so everything on this slide except the word up here and the, and the schematic symbol for a diffuser is the same as for a nozzle now just like in a nozzle we typically neglected the inlet kinetic energy if this is a good diffuser it will do a good job of decreasing the velocity of that fluid and we can typically ignore the kinetic energy at the exit so if the exit velocity is negligible this can be simplified to show that the kinetic energy at the inlet is equal to the change in the enthalpy across this device so here the kinetic energy is going down so the enthalpy is going up so if this were an ideal gas coming through here which typically is then the temperature will go up as the kinetic energy goes down so we have high velocity here here we have a low velocity 
but a higher temperature. So we're recovering some of that kinetic energy back into internal energy, essentially in a diffuser. Next, we want to turn our attention to heat exchangers. Now, we're not going to be showing a schematic symbol for heat exchangers just yet, because it turns out there's several different styles of heat exchangers that we're going to be analyzing, and the way the symbols look is a little bit different depending on the situation. So we're going to begin by talking about heat exchangers in general. So the first thing I want to do is make some common assumptions. And by that I mean assumptions that we can make regardless of what style of heat exchanger we're looking at. So these are assumptions that all the types of heat exchangers that we're going to be concerned with have in common. So again, we're going to be showing the impact of these assumptions on our energy equation. So the same starting point as always. Again, the first assumption is steady state. So the impact of that is that the unsteady term is zero. Next, potential energy changes in heat exchangers are definitely negligible. Heat exchangers are not designed to move a stream of fluid from one elevation up or down to a significantly different elevation. That's not what they're doing. So the potential energy terms can be ignored. Also, kinetic energy can be ignored. They're not significantly changing the velocity of the fluid that is coming and going out of them. So kinetic energy terms are gone as well. And there is certainly no work transfer. Remember, no shaft, no shaft work. So we can get rid of the work transfer term as well. So this is the set of assumptions that we'll be making regardless of what type of heat exchanger we look at. So the equation that remains is the heat transfer with the surroundings and the summation over the inlets of mass flow rate times enthalpy minus summation over the exits of mass flow rate times enthalpy. So notice that we have retained the summation signs here because it's quite common for our heat exchangers to have multiple inlets and exits. So now we want to take a look at a bunch of the different names that there are for heat exchangers. We've encountered a few of these already, particularly in the introduction to the course when I was looking at examples of different thermodynamic systems, but heat exchangers come by many, many names. Usually those names are quite descriptive of what's happening in the heat exchanger. For instance, a condenser or an evaporator, that describes what's going on inside of the heat exchanger, or in some cases it describes the purpose of the heat exchanger, such as an intercooler or a regenerator. We're going to be encountering most of these terms later on in the course. So the first style of heat exchanger we want to look at is one that has two separate fluid streams. So style number one here is two separate fluid streams. So the symbol we use for heat exchanger is quite simple, it's just a rectangle. But we show here fluid stream one entering at the bottom. So this is an inlet and that fluid goes through the heat exchanger and exits at two. And then usually a different fluid entirely enters at three and exits at four. So this particular heat exchanger has two inlets and two exits. Now important to realize that inside of this heat exchanger these two fluid streams do not mix. So they're flowing through separate channels of some sort. Now it's not the topic of this course to talk about heat exchanger design. So we're not going to be looking inside of here at how all of the pipes or everything inside of here is configured. You'll be taking a heat transfer course later in your program and that's where you'll look at heat exchanger design. What we're concerned with in this class is just the energy balance, the overall energy balance associated with a component like this. So we draw a control volume around this heat exchanger and the next thing we want to do is see are there any further assumptions that we've not already made that we can make for this particular type of heat exchanger. Now here's where we make an assumption that can seem a little bit strange at first. We're talking about a heat exchanger here but the assumption that we're going to make is that Q dot is equal to zero. So you might think why would we assume heat transfer is zero when the component that we're looking at is a heat exchanger. Isn't that all about Q dot? Well, yes and no. 
realize there is a lot of heat transfer happening in this style of heat exchanger but it's happening inside of our control volume between these two fluid streams so if we say this is a hot fluid going through here and a cold fluid going through there then there is all kinds of heat transfer happening but it's happening inside the heat exchanger the Q dot term in our energy equation doesn't care about that the Q dot term in our energy equation is solely concerned with the heat transfer between the system and the surroundings. In other words, a heat transfer crossing that dotted line, crossing our control surface. If that is negligible, then we can set the Q dot in our equation to zero. We're not saying that there's no heat transfer between these streams. Of course there is. That's the purpose of this device. But we're saying when we do this to our energy equation that the heat transfer between the system and the surroundings is negligible. That's typically a good assumption. Quite often these heat exchangers are insulated from their surroundings. Now the other thing to remember here is that this particular control volume has two inlets and two exits. So as we rewrite our conservation of energy equation we'll be setting Q to zero and we'll be bringing the inlets and exits explicitly into it. So what we're left with, conservation of mass tells us that m.1 equals m.2 and it also tells us that m.3 equals m.4. So just going back to our schematic, that just says this mass flow rate and this mass flow rate have to be the same and this mass flow rate and this mass flow rate have to be the same. That of course assumes steady state which we've already done. So that's what conservation of mass tells us. Conservation of energy will reduce to this. So we have m.1 times h1 minus h2. So that's the enthalpy change of one of the fluid streams plus m.3 times h3 minus h4. That's the enthalpy change of the other fluid stream. So notice that these two parts are coming from the summation over the inlets those are both inlets and these two parts are coming from the summation over the exits because those are both exits. We've just brought these together into a single term because their mass flow rate is common and we've brought these two together into a single term because they share the same mass flow rate. So that's what conservation of energy ends up looking like for this particular style of heat exchanger. So what's happening is that the enthalpy change of the two streams has to balance. Now remember, this equation is not saying that that has to equal this. We need to remember there is a mass flow rate out front here. So if the mass flow rate in these two streams is different, and it typically is, quite often they're different substances, perhaps steam is going through one side of the heat exchanger and cooling water is going through the other side to reduce the temperature of the steam, mass flow rates would typically be very different. We have to remember to bring those mass flow rates into this energy balance. It's not just a matter of the enthalpy of one stream going up and the enthalpy of the other stream going down by an equal amount. It's the mass flow rate times the enthalpy that has to balance. The second style of heat exchanger we want to look at is one where the two inlet streams mix. So here's our schematic for that again and again it's just a rectangle. We have two inlets labeled one and two and those two fluid streams go in here mix together and come out a single exit 3. So again our control volume is drawn around this device. Again the heat transfer with the surroundings, the Q dot term in our energy equation is going to be set to zero. So we're assuming that this is operating adiabatically, no heat transfer with the surroundings. And the impact on the equations, conservation of mass will tell us that m dot 3, the mass flow rate at the exit, is equal to the sum of the two inlet mass flow rates. And conservation of energy will simplify down to this. So we have two inlets, m.1h1 and m.2h2, 
and a single exit, m dot 3, h3. So that's what the energy equation looks like for this particular style of heat exchanger. The third style of heat exchanger we want to look at is one that has some external source of heat or perhaps a sink of heat. So again, the symbol is just a rectangle, but this one has just a single inlet and a single exit. And now our Q dot term in the energy equation is not negligible. There is some energy transfer by heat across our control surface. So we have a Q dot term now, but only one inlet and one exit. So conservation of mass tells us for steady operation, those two mass flow rates have to be equal. And we typically just write that as m dot with no subscript. And conservation of energy is going to tell us that we have our Q dot term retained now. We have a single inlet and a single exit. And we can rearrange this so that the heat transfer rate with the surroundings is the mass flow rate times the enthalpy at the exit minus the enthalpy at the inlet. And of course, this equation is exactly the same regardless of what the direction of heat flow is. So if we're adding heat, our Q dot would be positive. So this would be a positive number, and that would result in H2 being bigger than H1 in order to get positive on this side. But if we happen to be removing heat, then by our sign convention, that is negative heat transfer. So this will be a negative number, and our H2 will be smaller than H1. So it isn't two different equations for those two situations. Same equation, just the sign of each side is going to be different. So we want to take this principle and apply it to a little more complicated situation. So I'll describe what this is in a moment, but the point behind this is to illustrate that it is our choice of the control volume that governs what the simplified version of the energy equation ends up looking like. So that's what I want to do here. I want to contrast two possible choices for a control volume and show what impact those choices have on what the energy equation looks like. So this is a combustion chamber. So we have water coming in one inlet here and the entire purpose of this thing is to heat up that water. So we could think of this as a boiler or a water heater of some kind. So the water comes in here low temperature and leaves there at a higher temperature. Perhaps as steam, perhaps not. Just depends on the, on the conditions. So we also have air and methane coming in here. So this is essentially natural gas. So we have combustion air coming in and methane coming in. They combine together in here and they combust and the products of combustion come out here. So this would be water vapor, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and a few other elements. So this is a relatively complicated mixture of different gases. So this is the inlets and exits to our combustion chamber or to our boiler, we'll call it. Well, there's a couple of different ways to go about analyzing this thing. One possible approach is to focus on only the water side of this combustion chamber or of this boiler. So I've labeled the water inlet as one and the water exit as two. We could identify as our control volume just the water side of that and we're free to do that. We can place our control surface wherever we want to get a convenient analysis for our purposes. So here we've decided to treat the water side of this boiler as our control volume. Well notice that corresponds to the most recent style of heat exchanger that we looked at. We have a single inlet, a single exit, and a heat transfer from outside into our control volume. So we have heat transfer across our control surface from down here where the fire is into the water. So we get a conservation of energy equation that looks like this. Q dot will be equal to M dot H2 minus H1. Same result as we just got when we talked about that style of heat exchanger. Now we have another choice as well for how to analyze this situation. We could, if we wanted, draw control volume around the entire boiler. So now we 
clearly have more inlets and exits. We're going to have to number more state points. So the inlet of the methane, I've numbered three. The air inlet is four. And the exit here where the products of combustion are coming out, I've numbered five. Now if we take exactly the same starting equation, and that is the complete conservation of energy equation for a control volume, and apply it to this situation, then the result looks quite different than what we had when we looked at only the water side. So we would neglect the heat transfer with the surroundings. So again, heat transfer across this surface will be small relative to other things that are going on. But we now have three inlets and two exits that we need to include. So for that control volume, the energy equation will look like this. Steady state, so the left hand side is zero. The right hand side, work and heat transfer have both been set to zero. For the inlets and exits, kinetic and potential energy have been neglected, so the only term that remains is the enthalpy. And so we have our water inlet here, our water exit here, and we could make use of the fact that m.1 and m.2 have to be the same. Here we have our methane inlet and our air inlet and then finally the exit that is the products of combustion. So the same situation, a boiler operating at steady state, two different approaches to the analysis and they're exactly equivalent. The energy equation however looks very different in the two cases. So we need to become comfortable with choosing a control volume and understanding what impact that choice has on this process of simplifying our energy equation down to one that is applicable to the control volume we chose. Now just a, a footnote here, in the context of the class you're taking right now, we are not going to develop sufficient tools to be able to use this approach to analyzing a boiler. And I'm going to tell you why. Back when we were talking about properties of substances, we restricted the types of systems that we were going to look at to ones where there was no chemical reaction occurring. Now notice here there is certainly a chemical reaction occurring. So here we have an air inlet and a methane inlet and a chemical reaction occurs so that coming out of here we have CO2, H2O, nitrogen plus some other elements. So the chemical composition of the inlets is different than the exits. Now this equation as I've written it here is certainly still valid. There's no problem with that. However, the way we go about calculating these values of enthalpy that need to go in here, in particular these ones, because the chemical composition of this is different than the stuff coming out, the products of combustion, we need to calculate these enthalpies in a special way. And we're not going to look at that in the context of this current course. However, if we did that, we would be able to use this equation, no problem. The last component that we're going to look at here in our study of open system components is a throttling valve. And a throttling valve is a very important component for later on in the course when we're looking at refrigeration systems. So a throttling valve is nothing more than a restriction or an obstruction in a line. So the inlet of the throttling valve is state 1, the exit is state 2, and there is a pressure drop across this. So P1 is bigger than P2, so it causes a pressure drop in the flow. Now we want to do exactly the same thing to this as we've done to all of our other components. We want to start with a complete energy equation. We're going to apply it to this throttling valve and we're going to talk about the assumptions that we can make. So going through these, again steady state operation so this first term is zero. Heat transfer is negligible. These are very, very small components. They're not intended to exchange a whole bunch of heat with the surroundings. And in fact, in refrigeration systems, they're typically insulated. So heat transfer is negligible. 
so Q dot term is gone. Again, there is no shaft connecting this valve with the surroundings. It is delivering or consuming work, shaft work, so we can get rid of the work transfer term. And also, kinetic energy is negligible. There might be a bit of a difference in the speed of the material flowing in and out, but it does not amount to a significant change in kinetic energy, so we can get rid of those terms. Potential energy is also certainly negligible because there's very, very little elevation change, if any at all. And so these are the assumptions we've made so far. The only remaining ones is to realize that, again, we have just a single inlet and a single outlet. Now, if you take a look at what's left of the energy equation, the only thing that's left are these enthalpies. So this list of assumptions applied to this component leads us to the conclusion that for a throttling valve, the enthalpy does not change, a very important feature of a throttling valve. So we want to remember that H1 equals H2 for a throttling valve. And it's important to remember not just that fact, but that this is essentially the simplified version of conservation of energy for a throttling valve. Because all of these things are zero, it leads us to the conclusion that the enthalpy does not change. So lots of other properties do change across the throttling valve. Most notably, the pressure drops down. But the property that does not change across the throttling valve is the enthalpy.